this morning on this God. Hello. Appreciate your prayers and he's praying for us. Appreciate what God's doing in Scotland today. <clears throat> Continue to pray for all the goings on up there. Uh, the building in Corfer, uh, everything in Dundee, the uh, higher deputation, uh, what's going on in Glen Rockus with uh, Paul. So we pray for all these things if you will. God have his way and his will. And I appreciate that. As far as announcements go, we don't have a whole lot going on anytime real quick. Uh, got Brother Gary Farlow, talked to him yesterday. He's finally over all that stuff. And hallelujah for that. And, and the Lord with him, he's going to try to come and preach next Sunday at least one service. So we're looking forward to that. So you pray for him. Uh, help him pray for Brother Jim and Miss Carol. Uh, the Lord will touch them and help them. I haven't heard from Brother W.A. and Miss Sheila today. That we're here living in prayer. Uh, who else we need to talk about here? Everybody. That's pretty much everybody in the church. Uh, anybody else have an announcement this morning? No. All right. What about quiet today? Is it cold weather? What was going on? <laughs> anybody else, real quick? All right. All right. Young men, y'all come on. We'll receive the offering. You give us the Lord. We're happy to. Dearly, Paul, Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to come to church, Lord. We appreciate it. We need to bless the rest of the service. We need to bless the preaching, Lord. We need to preach with the right word to say. We need to touch a lost soul today, Lord, so that they can get saved. We need to bless the offering.
chapter 25.
try to put yourself in her position and what's going through her heart and mind. Verse 28, Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. And we'll stop reading there. Lord, I pray you take the reading of your word and help us this morning. I pray, God, that this psalm would be alive in our heart. And I pray, God, that he would encourage and help us today. I pray, Lord, for those that are lost in our midst today, that God would speak to their heart and show them their need for you, that they would call on the name of the Lord today and be saved. Lord, we pray that you encourage your people. God, may you strengthen us today through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we get to the message, and there are many messages in this psalm, uh, I would like to give you what I have titled some beautiful things that are in this psalm. And as you begin to study this psalm, you begin to see great beauty and many different things. I believe this to start with, it encourages us to trust in God. He said in verse number 2, uh, Oh my God, I trust in Thee. And in verse number 20, he said, Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. And as you go through this life, you're going to have doubts, and you may have fears. And the Word of God, if you'll read it and apply yourself to it, it'll encourage you to trust in the Lord. And this psalm in particular does just that. It encourages us to trust in God. It, tell, it, it encourages us to tell God of our troubles. Now, I don't know about you, but every now and again, life has a few troubles in it. Oh, yeah. A few. Sometimes your heart gets troubled. Sometimes your mind is troubled. Sometimes your body is in trouble. And this psalm, I do believe, encourages us to, to tell God of our troubles in verses 15 to 19 we've just read. But uh, he's got enemies. He's desolate. He's afflicted. He's, he's got a troubled heart. He's, he's got all these things going on in his life. Thank God we've got somebody we can tell our troubles to. Yeah. You can tell your troubles to God. He don't mind here. He's listening. Mm -hmm. Thank God he'll listen to his children. Amen. 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 I want to say it encourages us to be teachable. And to learn of God. He says over and over uh, about God teaching him. Look in verse 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. And, and then down in verse number 9. The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. He talks over and over about uh, God teaching him. And, and I believe this psalm encourages us to be teachable. Amen. We dealt with that in Psalms 119 over and over and over again in Sunday school years, a couple of years ago or so now, that, that we always need to be teachable. Yeah. To where we don't get to a place in our life that we think, I know it all. Right. Yeah. You know what kind of person is a know-it-all. <laughs> They're hard to be around, ain't they? they? They make you feel in many different ways. Amen? Uh, and, and we don't ever need to come to the place where we think we know it all. We always need to be teachable. And this psalm encourages us to be teachable and to learn of God. Another thing we want to think about uh, that I believe is a beautiful thing about this psalm, it enlightens us to some of the attributes of God. As you read down and you study and you ponder and meditate upon this psalm, you begin to see some of the attributes, some of the characteristics of God. Uh, look at verse 6 uh, through 8. He says, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies. One of the qualities, one of the attributes, one of the characteristics of God is that He is a merciful God. Amen. And, and really, when you got sin in your life, or if you got some trouble in your life, you need to remember God has got 
mercy. Amen. Amen. One of the attributes of God is mercy. Read Ephesians chapter 2, if you will. And he's got a whole lot of it. Amen. He goes on in, in, in verse number uh, 5. He said, oh, re Remember, excuse me, lead me in thy truth and teach me for the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O oh Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses. We serve a loving God. Brother Brad was quoting a verse to me the other day. I was speaking to him and he said, uh, love covers a multitude of sin. Amen. And our God is a loving God. And you may have a God that's trying to tell you to strap a bomb on your chest and go blow people up. But I have a God that teaches me that He is loving. That he's kind. He has a lot of loving kindness. I serve a loving and a kind God. Amen. Some of his attributes, it shows us that. It shows us that he is good. Look in verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. And this psalm encourages and it enlightens us uh, to the fact that God is good. God is a goodness. He has a lot of goodness. Some of the attributes of, of God, He enlightens us in this psalm. He enlightens us to the, to the aim of God in this psalm. What is the aim of God? Verse number 8, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will He teach sinners in the way. His aim is to teach sinners in the way. Amen? Amen? God's aim. When, when a preacher preaches a sermon, he ought to be aiming at you. Amen? God has a way of aiming at us. And He uses preaching to aim at us. He wants to teach sinners in the way. His desire is for a sinner to know Him. Isn't that right? What is the New Testament all about? I know we're in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, but the whole New Testament is about God revealing Himself to mankind so that sinners can be saved. His aim is to teach sinners in the way. He shows us that even in this psalm, way back in the Old Testament, the aim of God. May I say this, it enlightens us to the all and all of God. Notice what it said in verse 5. He said, but lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. You know, my, I like that song, brother, um, Saunders sings, uh, Christ is all. All in all. He's the God of my salvation. I was reading something yesterday and he was saying to believe that Jesus Christ died is history. But to believe Christ died for you personally is salvation. <clears throat> salvation. You want to be saved? you got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself. He's the God of my salvation. And He is my all. He is the only thing that I am trusting in this morning to be saved, to go to heaven. It's God. Salvation is in Him. Not myself, not my works, not my good deeds, not my, my good singing voice, not my, uh, my work, none of that. I'm trusting in God to be my servant. He's my all in all. This psalm enlightens us today. May I say not only that, but this psalm, some of the beautiful things about this psalm. This psalm incites us to lift our souls to God. Well, the Bible said in verse 1 here, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Say, preacher, I'm down. 
Sometimes you just need to lift your soul to God. Yeah. What did David do? Yeah. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes ain't nobody else do it. Sometimes there ain't nobody going to do it. Amen. <laughs> He said, well, that's the preacher's job. Sometimes the preacher ain't there. Sometimes the preacher just can't do it. He tries sometimes. But sometimes you just got to take your soul and lift it to God. Say, God, you're right. What's going to get us through persecution? You know what happens in persecution? We get all about it, don't we? You can't meet together like you used to. What's going to happen to our church when, when uh, the government does come down and say, you can't have church? What's going to happen to us? Have church anyway. What's going to happen if we have church anyway? The first person they're going to come get is me. Amen. That's what they've done in all the persecutions of the past. They go and they get the preachers and they try to take them in. And they try to show the people that we're going to have control over it. What you're going to have? You, you ain't going to have a preacher. You, you're not going to have a building to come to. And what's going to, you're going to be by yourself in many, many ways. Well, how am I going to deal with that? I'm going to have to lift my soul to God. I'm going to be a good witness. And a good testimony. The more you read about the Scottish Covenant, as you begin to see, they're hiding in barns. They're meeting out in the field the best they can. They're, they're, they're running from everything. I mean, it gets kind of crazy when all that happens. And you may find yourself all alone. You might be able to lift your soul to God. You're going to have to have a, have a book for yourself. You're going to have to know some scriptures on your own. Ain't nobody going to be there standing there patting you on the back and say, hey man, let's keep going. You have to lift your soul to God. David lifted his soul to God here. It, it incites us to lift our soul to God. This psalm incites us to be led into the truth. We have to be led. We are sheep, the Bible says. It's amazing. The government can come out and say, put on a mask. And the millions put on a mask. And a preacher can stand and say, repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. And they all turn away and walk away. We don't believe that. Amen. 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 The psalm encouraged, incites us to, to be led into the truth. We have to do that. Too. He's crying out to God to lead me, verse 5. Lead me in thy truth. The Holy Ghost will do that for me. Didn't He promise us that? In the New Testament? That He would guide us into all truth. Again, that personal relationship with God. For Him to be able to lead you into truth. Let me say this last thing, this, and then we'll get to the message. This psalm incites us to lean on the grace of God. Over and over, and we're going to preach on sin here in just a minute. You know we have to get there somehow or another. But uh, this psalm deals with sin a lot. Personal sin. But it also teaches us to incite. It incites us to lean on the grace of God. This, this man is talking about his own sin and he begins to cry out to God for mercy and for grace and for his loving kindness and all those things. And he leans heavy on God's grace. You know we need to lean on his grace. Because the bottom line is we're just a bunch of sinners. Amen. Right, yeah. I was saved by grace and I'm going to keep on leaning on grace. Amen. Yeah. And this psalm incites me to do so. As I read and I put, meditate on this psalm, it, it begins to teach me that, hey, God's got a lot of it, and I need to get a hold of it. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
them in and incite me to do that. This psalm is just so full of so many things. Well, let's get to the message. I got 20 minutes. Uh, I want to look at this particular psalm and, and, and look at sin for just a few minutes. To look at sin. It says it talks about sin in at least four different verses. Verse 7. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. Sounds like to me that, that David is saying, you know, when I was young, I had some sin. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sin. And he's asking God not to remember. Verse 8. He says this, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will He teach sinners in the way. Again, He mentions sin, sinners. Verse number 11, For Thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Iniquity is another word for sin, isn't it? Iniquity. Notice that He said it was great. I think my problem most of the time is I don't think my sin is that big. Amen. We get to think, well, it's just a little one. What, what did Lot say? He said, well, well Lord, what about that? It, 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 it's a little city. It, couldn't we just go here? But David is saying, no, my iniquity, it's great, it's big, it's, 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 it's in front of me, I can't get around it. Verse 18, he says this, Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. It ain't just one sin. It's plural. S on the end. More than one, isn't it? Yeah. You got more than one. I got more than one. Amen. Huh? We have sins that we must deal with as a child of God. Yeah. We must. So I want to look at sin in this chapter. I want to define sin out of the dictionary. It says this, whatever is contrary to God's commands or law. Pretty simple definition. Whatever is contrary, opposite to, against, to God's commands or law. There's two different kinds of sin we can commit. We, we have... Uh, we have sins of commission. Right? You do what you're not supposed to do. Yeah. Thou shalt not kill. And you go kill. You've committed a sin. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's a sin you do. A commission. Thou shalt not steal. It was just a ballpoint opinion. Take it back. Yep. Amen. Thou shalt not steal. Yep. Thou shalt not covet. All those laws that, that we can commit sin. I'm talking about the doctrine of sin. Then we have sins of omission. I know I was supposed to do it, but just didn't do it. Children, thou shalt, uh, he, when he say, obey thy parents in the Lord, for this is right. But you don't do it. It's not that you committed anything, you just didn't do what you were supposed to do. That's a sin. Mom said, clean the room. But you didn't do it. That's a sin and a omission. Well, that's my room. <laughs> we can justify, our, justify ourselves pretty easy there. Yeah. Oh, Lord. A sin of omission. The doctrine of sin. Let, let's think about the doctrine of sin for just a moment. Uh, let me say this about sin. We were born into sin. We'll look at a verse. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. 
Most of you know all this stuff. But uh, it doesn't hurt to refresh. Amen. Romans chapter number 5. I, I'm not trying to do away with the beautiful things of this song. One of the most beautiful things about this song that we're looking at is that yes, man can sin and has sinned. And he can be forgiven. Yeah. Hallelujah. What a beautiful thought. That God can take our sin and do away with it. The doctrine of sin. We're born into sin. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. You know why you're going to die? You're a sinner. You're born a sinner. You're born a sinner. Whether you believe it or not. What you believe has no bearing on what this book says. That's right. Amen. But what this book says does have a bearing on you. Amen. Amen. And if this book says I was born into sin, it don't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher's kid. It don't matter if you didn't think it's going to We've said all this before. Uh, it doesn't matter who your mom and dad is. Right. It don't matter what religion you're from. Right. You can be Baptist. You can be Catholic. You can be Buddhist. You can be anything you want to be. But the fact of the matter is you were born into sin. Religion don't fix that. It can't change that. You were born into sin. I was born into sin. David said, in sin, my mother conceived me. Sin is birth. It's in our flesh. It's in us. Little babies. Little babies got sin. Daniel and Anna are getting first hand. <laughs> Learning on all that. She knew it. But man, it's real relevant now, isn't it? <laughs> and you didn't even have to teach it to them. You don't have to teach a child a lie, do you? She just does it. She just does it. But they're cute. Yeah, they're cute liars. What they are. <laughs> Real cute liars. You don't have to teach them to be rebellious. They just don't. Why? Why? Because they got seen. They were born that way. You and I were born that way. The doctrine of sin teaches us that we're born into sin. But not only that, we have willingly committed. Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as basic and as, uh, as simple as I can possibly be on this subject of sin. The doctrine of it. Uh, we're born into sin. We have willingly committed sin. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Uh, the Bible says, this, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Not only were you born into sin, you, you willingly committed sin. Now I realize when the baby's laying there in the little manger or the basket, mama went up and had it, not this time, but last time, and mama still got the bassinet that I was laid in when I was a child. <laughs> one of those white, wicker looking things. You remember those? You old folks, man. Uh, I'm one of you. Amen. Uh, still got that thing. And when she laid me in that, that bassinet, I was a sinner. Now, I hadn't willingly committed nothing yet, but I was born that way. But I graduated out of that bassinet. 
finally got home to bed. Brother Dennis was talking to the girls this morning. How do you like that big girl baby? You know what? They've already willingly committed. Okay. Willing. Through their mind. That rebellion or that uh, riot or whatever it might be. You willingly commit sin. Knowing that it is wrong, you do it anyway. That is sin. Willingly committing it. And everybody in this room has willingly committed sin. Amen. 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 You were born that way, and you've willingly done it. That is the doctrine of sin. Let me say this. This chapter of Psalms, chapter number 25, it also shows us how to deal with our sin. I, I like this passage of Scripture. This, this chapter is just full, just so full of so many different things. And it teaches us how to deal with sin. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth. What is he doing? He's confessing. How do I deal with my sin? How do you deal with your sin? What, how do we do it by the book? The one that needs to be confession. I'm not talking about going to a priest. That ain't in the book. We're not going to a priest. We're going to God. And confessing our sin. There must be confession. If someone wants to be forgiven, maybe somebody's uh, committed a sin against you, how can you forget them, forgive them if they never confess it to you? If they don't confess it, that's telling me they don't want it. They don't think they need it. So there must be confession. For chapter 32 and verse uh, uh, number 5, I believe it is. Uh, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, talking about God, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Watch this. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. So when I'm dealing with my sin, I've got to confess it. There must be a confession. Remember not the sins of my youth. Every time I go back to North Carolina, I try to avoid places that I knew I wasn't doing well. But that's something I, you know, riding down the road sometimes I remember things. And I, you know. <laughs> I was telling Sarah the other day, I was talking about, uh, we wrote, my stepdad, he's got one, two, three, about four different vehicles, I think, parked in the woods that had been dead for years. I rode by one of them, I told Sarah, I'll rode now. There's trees growing up through it. Big trees. It's been a long time ago. Uh, all that kind of stuff. And I, and I, I, I don't know if it was her out there somebody else oh, about my first truck. I remember my first truck. Man, that thing was pretty. And I committed a sin. I was driving too fast up the dirt road and playing and fishtailing. Doing doing that. And I thought me and that vehicle were one. And you know what happened? My sin caught up in me. And the next thing I know, I'm rolling in the ditch. CBs in the car, Coke bottles, banging me in the head. And my sin had found me. <laughs> Remember not the sin of He confessed them. He confesses his sin. 
2, let me say this, about dealing with our sin, there needs to be contrition. What do you mean by that? A broken heartedness for sin. We're not talking about just lip service. You go to some churches, you sit in a little box and there's another fellow on the other side and you can confess your sin to them and you're just telling them you're doing lip service. For number one, they cannot do anything about your sin. They don't have that kind of power. Only God has the power to deal with your sin. And so they confess their sin with a lip service. But we're talking about more than a lip service. We're talking about uh, a broken heartedness for a sin. Not just being uh, sad because you got caught. Nobody get caught for you. But we're talking about not being sad just because you got caught, but being sad that you did or didn't do it. A contrition. Being broken hearted for. The day I got saved, I was broken hearted over my sinful condition. Let me read you a few verses here. You will have to turn there, but in Psalms 34 and verse number 18, uh, the Bible says this, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Chapter 51 this is the great psalm, David repenting. Uh, psalms 51. And by the way, Christians do need to repent. Amen. 51 and verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Isaiah chapter number 57. It says this. Uh, Isaiah 57 and verse number 15. Uh, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Preachers preach all the time on revival. We need revival. The only way we're going to get revival is to have a contrite spirit. Yeah. Humble. As long as we're walking around in our pride, they ain't going to be no revival. You know why there ain't no revival in America? Because we're full of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. We're just full of ourselves. From the preachers and the pastors mm -hmm. all the way down. We're just full of ourselves. we got to get contrite. Mm -hmm. One other verse, Isaiah chapter 66, verse number 2. For all those things that mine hand made and all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. There must be confession. To deal with my sin, there must be confession. There must be contrition. A broken heartedness for sin. Let me say this lastly on that point. There must be a calling out to God. If you want forgiveness, you've got to ask. Amen? Mm -hmm. If you've offended me, or if I've offended you, either way, how am I going to get forgiveness from you if I don't ask for it? Amen? Mm -hmm. The Bible said to call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. You want God to save you? Confess your sin to Him. Be contrite. Be humble about it. And call on His name. <laughs> you can be forgiven of sin. David in this Psalm, chapter number 25 mentions his sin. Again, he said, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity. For it is great. What is he doing? He's asking God for forgiveness. God, please pardon me. My iniquity is so great. I don't know what he did here. Doesn't really matter. Sin, sin. He understood. 
understand the difference between David and Saul. Saul was head and shoulders above all the rest. Saul didn't have a clue how to get right with God. David did. David knew how to repent. Turn his heart to God. And get forgiveness. How great is your sin? So I preach, well, I ain't never got drunk. I ain't never gonna go. I ain't never cuss. Your sin is still great. It's what's keeping you from having a relationship with God. Dealing with your sin, the doctrine of sin. Let's do it last thing. I don't my time to talk about. Let's talk about doing away with sin. I believe the psalm teaches us how to do away with sin. Verse 7 Again, remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. How do I do away with my sin? And I must depend on God's mercy. Only mercy can do away with it. Amen. I can't work up enough to get it gone. Can you? So I'll preach for my good works. If I can just do enough good to have my man, I'll be all right. No. That don't work. That certainly ain't in here. And it's certainly, I've never seen it work at all. Why? Because I ain't never seen nobody do it that way today. Now we talk about, well, that person's a good person. You wouldn't have to need far if you'd find sin. Especially if you got in secret. Down in the heart. We've all sinned. Mercy. We must have mercy to do away with our sin. Verse 11, we just read, we must have a pardon. We must have a pardon. Verse 18 talks about forgiveness. Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sin. Let me put it simply, only God can do away with my sin. I can't do that. The Bible says He's cast our sin behind His back. He said it went as far as the east is from the west. Who done that? God did. I didn't. I simply came to the altar and asked God to forgive me. He did the forgiveness. He did the pardon. He, he gave the mercy. Who can do away with my sins? God can. Only God can. And this psalm teaches us that. It teaches us many things. But it sure teaches us about our sins. Isn't it strange how God puts in the beauty of this psalm, talking about the wonderful things of God, how He teaches us how about and how to deal with our sin and to get it gone. What a wonderful psalm this is. And if you're not saved this morning, there is a way to be saved. There is a way. There's only one way. Yeah. And that way is Jesus. Yeah. You gotta call on him. Yeah. You gotta confess that sin. You gotta come clean. Amen. You gotta deal with it. Quit trying to hide it. No, everybody knows. Amen. You're the only one that's denying it. Amen. Everybody knows you got sin in you. But you. You got to come clean to God. You got to let God have His way in your heart. Let's bow for prayer. We'll all stand. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved. And you know, you know already before this sermon ever started, you are sinning. And you need to be saved. Could I invite you to come to the altar and pray? And ask God to save you today. Say, I'm a 
preacher's child here. I, hey, listen, every one of my children are sinners. And every one of them need to be saved. They had been saved already, they need to be. They've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so has everyone else. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, I invite you to come. Would you come this morning? Maybe there's a sinner on your heart this morning. God put them in your heart today to pray for them. Is there anybody on your heart this morning? God, would you save them? God, please, heal them. Father, I pray you take the message and help us this morning. I thank you, Lord, for this song. I pray, God, that we would lean heavily upon your grace. That we would cast ourselves upon you, your mercies. God, help us as your children to, to deal with our sins in the correct fashion. Help us, Lord, to, to walk more humbly, more contritely. And, and Lord, may we see that reviving that we need to see. God, may you dwell with us. And Lord, we ask you for the sinner today. God, please, please speak to their heart and show them their need for you. God, may these things that we've said today be more than just words. May they be conviction. May they be a help to them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Appreciate you being here today. Nobody's come, so we'll conclude the service this morning. Lord willing, we'll be back tonight at 5 o'clock. We pray for the service tonight. And God will come by and visit with us. He don't have to. We don't deserve it. But we sure do. Amen. Amen. We sure do. All right, God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 5. We'll